Dear students, now we move on to another aspect of the biological profile, which is age. Remember, before we worked on sex determination, and now we're going to look at specifically chronological age, or you could also use the term uh, age at death. So before we worked on is this skeleton an individual who is male or female? And remember that we have to be careful with sex determination because we need to wait for those secondary sexual characteristics to develop in order to accurately age a skeleton by viewing either the skull or the pelvis with the pelvis being probably the most accurate, more accurate than the skull. And of course, sex is different from gender. And you know, gender is how you see yourself based on your society and, and your genitalia as well as uh, how it's perceived both through you and others. Uh, you know, male and female is typically seen as binary. Uh, and then, of course, we have to be careful because it's very challenging to sex the skeletons of individuals who are children or even into early adolescence. The um, age of death is actually a little more accurate for children, and it's a little more challenging when you have people who have moved into adulthood. Now, the name or title of this lecture is Chronological Age, specifically as a chronology, as a number, as the revolutions around the sun, right? That's effectively what an Earth year is. So you are interpreting this as, right, how am I going to determine that this skeleton is this many revolutions around the sun, for instance, as well as when you look at a, a crime scene or materials that have come from a crime scene, human skeletal materials, what you're actually doing, and this also you do in archaeology, is you're, you're estimating the age of that individual's skeleton um, when they died. So that's another important distinction. So just be cognizant that we're using a chronological method because you can think um, when somebody says adult, right, what does that mean? Um, we can think of that in terms of growth and development. But when you say adult, you know, oftentimes that might mean like, for instance, what does adult mean in the United States? That you're 18 years old. And then when you're an adult, what are some of the benefits you are afforded? Things like, you know, driver's license, uh, being able to vote, being able to purchase alcohol or tobacco, you know, a number of these things. They actually, you know, we, we actually gain certain components or a right uh, as we move up in age. And so understand that those are different things. Um, and then after we go through age of death or chronological age, we'll start marching through things like ancestry, living stature, and hopefully we can make it to things like pathology, but that might be an extended unit. Here are some of the ways in which we age skeletons. And I have two columns here and they have a number of different rows. And those two columns cover things like subadult and adult. When I use the term subadult, you're typically, um, you're typically using the term less than 20 years of age. And we usually bracket some of these, you know, ranges into five year age ranges, although we can get even more accurate when we have, you know, remains of of babies and, and those as a product of a stillbirth birth or babies that are only a few months old because we can we can actually be pretty accurate uh, in tr maybe even the specific uh, trimester uh, and we can also get within typically a month of accuracy with very small uh, babies. Uh, children and into early and late adolescent, we usually use five-year age ranges zero to four, you know, six to nine, 10 to 14, and 15 to 19 or 20. Uh, and those are pretty accurate. Uh, but then when you get to adult aging, then there are, are more challenges. So subadult age, aging of the skeleton is usually pretty accurate. 
we use tooth formation and tooth eruption. So we know that your teeth actually develop at a very consistent rate and they emerge and erupt and you know permanently situate themselves into the jaw at you know regular time periods. And we have two sets of teeth. We have baby teeth, milk teeth, or deciduous teeth, and then you have adult teeth. And the configuration of them is different. And we also have what's known as epiphyseal fusion. Your bones will, just like when we covered, you know, things in non-human and human bones, our bones develop the diaphysis, the long, like shaft part of the bones, they will develop and grow and expand. And then the epiphyses, uh, the epiphyseal ends on, on each end, what they will do is they will eventually develop and then fuse to the long bone shaft. And you can see that fusion is quite delayed in humans. We have delayed maturation. And this is one way to, you know, be able to tell the difference between human and non-human remains. But we also have uh, a delay in maturation that goes into adolescence and late adolescence, right? There are some aspects of the collarbone or the clavicle, the medial aspect, the clavicle may not fuse up until, you know, maybe 20, late 20s. Um, but when you see some an individual who's aged at death, 15 to 20 years of age, you'll see lots of lines of fusion that are closed and then you'll see some aspects that look still open. We can also use long bone length. Uh, while an uh, individual is developing, we can actually take measurements from studies on growth over time, and we can use that as a determinant uh, for age. However, once you have individuals that are fully grown, uh, grown and developed, then you can't really use long bone length anymore. Uh, adult aging... Um, this can be a challenge. So when you look at tooth formation and tooth eruption, you're dentally an adult by around 21 years or a, uh, years of age, plus or minus a, a few months or years. So you could have all your wisdom teeth that are completely erupted, emerged and erupted by 19 or 20 or 21. Sometimes it could be as late as 22 or 23, but that would be dentally an adult. And if you were to look at a skeleton, it began making initial assessments, you would look at the teeth if you had them available. Do you see any baby uh, deciduous teeth? Uh, if you don't, uh, you should see adult teeth. And then you would look to see if the third molar is developed or it's fully emerged. Um, if it's not, then you can say around, right? Around, um, you know, 20, 21 years, uh, years of age, probably a little bit under because they haven't fully emerged. And once you're dentally an adult, uh, we can't use any of the other signatures as a sub adult because now your epiphyses are completely fused um, and you're fully grown. So we can't use long bone length and your teeth are all fully erupted, uh, formed and emerged. So what we have to use is oftentimes things that we notice over time in adults. And most of that has to do with things like arthritis or osteoarthritis at the joints. So the pubic symphysis is probably one of the most accurate techniques we have for aging adult remains. What we're, we're, we're not do good at doing is, is getting the same type of precision and resolution, high resolution that we can get with subadult remains. So with skeletal aging of adults, we usually have to put them into three categories, uh, young adult, middle adult, or older adult. So 21 to 34, 35 to 49 and 50 plus. Those would coincide respectfully with young, middle and older adult. And yes, if you're 50 plus or more, that's all we can oftentimes say. Although there are other techniques, uh, some of them that are quite new and uh, nuanced that might actually get uh, closer to that, to that age. Uh, the best, again, the best technique we have is actually with the pubic symphysis, which is an area where you have the articulation center of both uh, pubic bones, the left and the right on the pelvis. And there's a face on the pubis that will eventually, um, the organization of it will erode and it will be because of use and, and wear over time 
uh, you walking through your, uh, using your skeleton. The auricular surface is an area that articulates with the pelvis and the sacrum, and that will also degrade over time. Your sternal rib end, ends that that actually articulate with your sternum body, uh, they will actually decay over time, and there are ways to determine that. Cranial suture closure is another technique that has been used. Um, however, we're not quite sure the effective, effectiveness of it. This is where you have sutures, right, that separate different bones on your, on your skull and your cranium. They will eventually, some of them will fuse completely and you won't even see that line of fusion anymore. And some people have suggested this is because of remodeling of the skull as you age. But we've also seen some skulls and crania that don't look like they've uh, the sutures have closed completely and they're 50, 60, 70 years old. And so that the cranial suture method hasn't been quite verified accurately, but it is still used as a technique. And if you have more of the skeleton on a case, you would you would use as many techniques as possible that you could employ. And then that would might get you a much narrower age range or give you confidence in the age range that you actually chose. Um, one of one of the challenges, of course, is if you only have one piece, but that's what you would, you would use. That would be the techniques that, that's there. Uh, and then you would also likely use the one. Uh, if you were kind of waffling between the estimate from any one of them, you would use probably the most accurate. And so with subadult remains, the most accurate is... Uh, dental development, dental formation, and eruption of teeth, and the most accurate among adults is the pubic symphysis. Here's a good chart that shows you what uh, the development of the human dentition looks like. Now, when you're a child or a baby, um, you have baby teeth or child teeth or deciduous teeth, what will happen is that you typically have five in each quadrant of your mouth. Remember, we, we looked at uh, things like the types of teeth that you have when we studied uh, parts of the skull and the cranium. And so your baby teeth have five in each quadrant. That would mean a total of 20. Your baby teeth are typically two incisors, one canine, and two molar teeth. And those two molar teeth are replaced by premolar teeth or bicuspids. And of course, your incisors and your canines your central and lateral incisors in your canines will will actually be replaced by adult teeth of those same class, and so you don't have premolars when you're when you have ch ch child teeth. And so on this chart, it will show you uh, teeth in blue are the ones that are considered baby milk teeth or d deciduous teeth, and the teeth that are clear or in white, um, those are permanent teeth. And when you get a, a jaw from the maxilla or the mandible, then you will notice that, especially with child teeth, is that you'll see some a, a mix of adult teeth and a mix of baby teeth, particularly when you get into um, later years, five, six, seven, eight. Um, you can see it on the chart fairly clearly here. Um, individuals that only have baby teeth, then you're pretty sure you're looking, you know, at an individual that probably is less than uh, four years of age. Uh, there are other ways to figure out, you know, very accurately using this chart with radiographs or x-rays where you have a specimen and then you, sub you submit it to x-rays and then you will be able to see other components inside the jaw that haven't erupted. That will really help you uh, aging a skeleton. You can notice that right around 21 years of age, all the teeth are in. The last tooth, the, the third molar, is starting to erupt, right? Emerge at 15 years of age, give or take a few years, and then plus or minus a few years, but usually about 21 years of age, you are dentally an adult. So you can look birth, uh, before that in utero, we can determine that a, a child a skeleton, uh, this, that the baby 
was not actually born or even brought to term. It was prenatal. And then we a pretty good way to accurately determine with teeth around the time of birth and usually six, nine, uh, one year, and even 18 months. But you can see once you get into two, three, four, five years, um, you will also have errors of plus or minus a few here, years here and there. That's why we typically use five-year age ranges uh, when we when we determine the sub-adult age ranges. But you can get good resolution at zero to one years of age or even prenatal. And then, you know, something like one to four, five to nine, 10 to 14, 15 to 19 um, are good age ranges, very accurate when you use dental development. Another good way to estimate subadult remains is to use epiphyseal fusion. Though it's not as accurate and precise as dental development, you can get within a few year accuracy and maybe closer if you use a number of these aging stages and components in consort. So if you look at the chart uh, on the far left with the full skeleton in anterior view, here are a few of the articulation centers. And there are several more than just these. But these are some of the most predominant ones. And of course, if you have the entire skeleton, you could make this ass assessment. Oftentimes, as a forensic anthropologist, you may not get um, if, you know, full recovery or if the, the full remains were at the scene when they were recovered at the scene, at, you know, at the scene of the crime, uh, for instance. But you can find these, you know, centers of fusion uh, on, on most, if not all bones. Understand that when you're a subadult, you usually start off with 400 or so bones. And when all those bones fuse, typically only have about 206 in your adult body. And if you look at the chart uh, in the middle, it shows you how, remember that human remains don't look as developed as non-human remains because we don't, um, we don't age as fast as they do, as, as well as there's pressure on non-human organisms to age quickly so that they can be more competitive in their environment. It's kind of a natural selection, uh, selective pressure argument. And that makes sense. And if you look at the image in the middle, it shows you how underdeveloped are our humerus, for instance, this is a right humerus in anterior view, how primitive it looks at birth. And then it looks more like humerus, probably around the time uh, that you get about five or six years of age, but you can see that the epiphyseal ends, the humeral head in the proximal area and the joint at the elbow, which includes the distal part of the humerus, there are little bits and pieces of, of, of epiphyses that eventually will fuse and the timing of fusion, like if you are missing that last bit of the piece of the medial epicondyle at 15 years in D. Um, I have, I've seen humeri, right? That's a plural of humerus or humerus, uh, um, humerus, uh, humeral bone. And um, I have seen it where it doesn't have that small little piece fused. And you might be able to get really accurate, it says around 16 to 18 with males and 15 to 17 with females. Notice that the age range is older for males because females actually fully develop first before males. We know that in humans. That's why you see males with a, a growth spurt that happens a little bit later than females. If you look at the x-ray in the bottom right corner, it kind of gives you an idea. There's a growth plate in the middle between the diaphysis and the epiphysis. The epiphysis is what fuses. The diaphysis is what begins to grow and elongate. We can also use things like long bone length. Now, uh, there are studies that are conducted every time uh, that you go to a doctor. Oftentimes, that information is put in a national system. This is when you're when you're a child and you're developing, when you go to your pediatrician and they're recording things like how tall you are. Now, um, we, we don't always have the specific data from you going to pediatrician, like your leg length or your sitting height, but we do record those in mass for national health surveys. And we've been doing it in the United States for, 
for decades, almost 50 years. So we could actually use the length of the leg. And this is something that more and more is happening in, fr in forensic anthropologists, uh, among forensic anthropologists, where you take a number of different measure, uh, measurements of the corpse or the, the decedent of the body before it's processed down to the skeleton, because there might be some measures that could help you when a number of, of, of fleshy bits are still on the individual. So something like hitting a sitting height, that's your height um, as you sit down, how tall you are sitting down, and then your leg length is typically around the area of the crease when you're sitting down to, you know, to the very end close to your kneecap or your patella, or typically it's the longest at the medial, uh, medial condyle, the distal part of the femur. So we don't have these types of analogs for skeletal remains, but we do have some, you know, good number of studies that actually did measure bones while, you know, children are developing. And then we can measure the, the length of a bone a femur, humerus, radius, ulna, tibia, fibula, what have you. And then we can compare it to charts like this. And you can see that it has age in years. And of course, it has to do with uh, percentiles. The very thick line on these charts um, in the middle shows the average, the, the mean or the median. And then you move away specific standard deviations on here. One, two right? 2.5. If you have somebody who's really tall, you know, really long legs, then they would exceed a uh, standard deviation for something like, you know, 2.5 in this case. So you will have some of that variation where somebody might look taller for the age or shorter for, for the age. We do know that individuals, uh, when we look at height, height is a product of probably about 150 to 180 genes in your body in terms of in part of your biology as well as your environment if you don't get enough nutrients while you're growing then you might have stunted growth so this can also cause a variation it's something to be aware of but we also have what's known as catch-up growth where maybe sometimes you're sick and your body can't actually expand energy on growth at the moment it's helping protect you and jump starting your immune system that's where all your caloric intake and energy is going towards. But then we also have something that's called catch-up growth, that if this nutritional deficiency isn't so long, then your body actually will resume and at a pace where it will get you back to that trajectory where you were supposed to meet. I've taken, I've seen it with my son. When I took him one time to the doctor, he was sick and many of his values were low for growth. Um, but then when we took him back, he was right where he should be um, and on the right trajectory, whereas if when he was sick, the trajectory showed him as being very short, for instance. So these are phenomena we know in growth and development. And yes, long bones can be used uh, quite accurately to determine at least five-year age ranges. And even younger, we have all sorts of calibrations to determine with the length of some of the bones, uh, babies that are prenatal or postnatal. The pubic symphysis is the most accurate and well-studied adult aging technique. That's what we're moving into now. And you can use the pubic symphysis, you can use the auricular surface, and you can use cranial suture closure, and you can use sternal rib ends. Pubic symphysis is one that has been studied typically with the uh, LA County Medical Examiner's Office with tens of thousands of, of, of individuals. And it's been replicated. I mean, that was probably the second or third time the study was replicated based on other skeletal collections that we've talked about that accumulated at the Smithsonian as well as um, the Cleveland uh, Museum of Natural History in Case Western Reserve, right? We have the Todd and and the Terry collections. And um, we looked at the history and development of, of forensic anthropology. And this pubic symphysis was well studied in all these collections and still is demonstrating that it's quite accurate. And it can get us into the ranges like young adult, 20 
1 to 34 years of age, middle adult 35 to 49 years of age, or uh, older adult 50 plus. And this is a typically a, a, a joint and it's cartilaginous, which connects both the left and right pubis uh, bones. And then you have the symphysis, just like the symphysis on your mandible that eventually fuses. This one doesn't. It shows a clear separation between left and right uh, pelvis. Um, but what will happen over time is that this joint will begin to break down based on just usage and your skeleton being on the earth for that long. And what will happen is, if you look at the image on the right, the largest image, it shows you two uh, pelvis from different sides. Um, the one on the left actually is showing you a much younger one where you have these ripples and these billowing um, surfaces that are consistent throughout the face of the pubis. But as you age, and as there's continued friction at this joint, just from movement over time, uh, repeatedly and repetitively, then the, the nice kind of consistent organization of that billowing will, will actually fade. It will all level out into one surface and then it will begin to kind of like slough, uh, kind of look like it's sloughing off the face and you know you also have lots of irregular surfaces whereas a younger pelvis typically has surfaces that are more consistent and and have you know consistent patterns whereas as you age then that whole face becomes level it begins to uh, look like it's again kind of sloughing off and then it will form other bubbles and ripples that are you know, irregular in pattern. Cranial suture closure is a technique that has been employed. It was calibrated using a site, an archaeological site, you know, skeletons from an archaeological site in, in Ohio. However, it, it hasn't really quite been verified. We know that sutures begin to close and the, the cranial vault that kind of covers, for the most part, the, the brain and the meningeal grooves and everything inside, uh, that it remodels and that remodeling might also create little bits and bone of bone that actually fuse, uh, you know, the sutures together. And they might become obliterated and you don't really see them as organized as before, just like the pubic symphysis. If you look at the image here on the right, of course, the image on the left is the right lateral view. It's showing you a number of different points, one through 10, that you would score, that you would look on, on the cranium and see if the sutures are open, that they've still retained their shape, or have they started to fill in with bone, or sometimes they're completely obliterated and gone. You don't have any... Um, suture line that exists, but you can actually see where it originated before. Uh, the image on the right shows uh, two sagittal sutures. We're looking at the um, superior view, and along that sagittal suture, you can see that the image on the right has a more consistent and prominent suture, whereas the one on the left does not. You can see bits and pieces of bone that are filled in, and areas where it's almost where it is completely gone, uh, and so we would interpret that the cranium on the left is older uh, than the one on on the right, and so based on that technique, that would be true. However, again, this technique isn't the best. It it actually can lead to some inaccuracies. So you should you should use other techniques if you have them available to you with with you in the skeletal assemblage that the forensic anthropologist is is engaging and encountering with however um if you had a more complete skeleton you would use one of the other techniques if it's all you had right then you might be only using cranial suture closure sternal rib ends have also been shown to be very accurate in terms of aging techniques in the skeleton. However, you can see that ribs are oftentimes very fragile and you also have 
rib fractures and breaks in a number of different, um, you know, crimes that involve that involve foul play. And so what you notice is just like with the pubic symphysis, for instance, that the rib of a child in their mid-teens will usually have some very nice organized bone that's distributed on the sternal rib end that articulates with the sternum body um, and manubrium. Um, and then over time, it begins to kind of create uh, a, con a concavity and then the edges of the sternal rib begins to fray and kind of get sharper and disorganized. The, the This technique was created by Mahmoud Ishan, and he was successful in demonstrating that this was accurate, and a number of other uh, researchers have created studies that have duplicated this and shown that it's quite accurate, accurate and even using different ribs because some of these techniques only used like maybe the sixth rib or the fifth rib, but we're finding that it also is consistent on some of the other ribs. So another technique that's quite accurate um, that can be employed to determine within, uh, you know, 15 year age ranges, uh, it, whether somebody is young, middle or older adult.